All right, it's five o'clock. Let's get started with this webinar on the machine learning advantage. Um, if you guys can hear me, okay. Could you uh, put something in the chat? Just so I have some feedback that I know that the, uh, the tech is set up correctly. Okay, Nelson. Nelson says, okay. LTV, here you're fine. <laughs> That's a lot of feedback. Okay, guys, thanks. Um, so I want to make this a bit interactive. So while, uh, while I'm doing the webinar, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. And uh, so feel free to answer in the chat. I've got the chat window open right here. Um, so I'll be monitoring it. So if you have a bunch of questions uh, about, the, uh, about machine learning, you can put them in the chat. And at the end of this webinar, I'll do a Q&A and I'll go into um, so I'll, I'll go into five or seven questions, depending on how much time we have. Um, I'll try to, um, to keep this webinar, um, uh, I'll try to talk for one hour. I, usually I do not succeed. Uh, usually my webinars are a bit longer than one hour, but don't worry, uh, we're recording. So if you have um, another appointment afterwards and you have to leave early, uh, halfway through, um, I will email you the recording afterwards. So. Don't worry about that. Um, hey, to, ch to start, uh, so we're al we almost have 30 people live watching this. Awesome. Um, can you put in the chat where you are from? So um, where, um, uh, where you're based. So Kevin, Bermuda. Uh, Kurok D says Germany. Uh, John is in Scotland. Nelson is in Brazil. Uh, I saw India flashing past. B Chan is in Los Angeles, USA. Mark in ne the Netherlands. Mark, nice. Hey, my name is also Mark, and I've also lived in the Netherlands for 40 years. What a coincidence. Uh, Mihai from Chicago. LTB from Lithuania. Awesome. Okay, very nice. See, so that's how we're going to do it. I'll ask a question, and you guys just respond in the uh, in the chat. Um, okay, so. Let's get started. Um, so I'm, we're streaming this live, uh, this webinar. So you're watching this on Zoom right now. So Amit Kumar from India. Hi. So I think we have a history, Amit. Uh, your name looks very familiar. <laughs> um, so I'm, we're live streaming this uh, to Facebook. So this is my phone and it's showing the uh, Facebook live stream of this very same uh, webinar. So if there are technical issues uh, for whatever reason and you get knocked off the connection and you can't get back on uh, because Zoom will only allow 100 live viewers simultaneously. So if you can't get back on, uh, feel free to go to my Facebook page and watch the live stream there. It's exactly the same webinar. So, um, okay, so let's get started. Uh, one quick question. I, this is the second webinar I am doing, um, I am doing uh, this week. Um, so I did a um, I did a webinar on Tuesday, which was about the career advantage of machine learning. So how many of you have seen that other webinar? So if you if you were in my webinar on uh, Tuesday, then please let me know. So Joaf was in there. Yeah, I recognize your name. Diomedes was. Hector says it was excellent. Thank you, Hector. Charlie. Yep. Yeah. Nelson, yep, awesome. Okay, so um, this, there's gonna be a small overlap. So most of this stuff is unique new content that you haven't seen before, um, but there's gonna be a small overlap um, of stuff that you saw in the other webinar. So um, um, bear with me, you know, you're gonna see two slides that you've, already know, that you've already seen, and then we'll get on to the cool stuff, to the unique stuff that you haven't seen yet. So um, to start with, so here's a, here's a typical software developer career path that um, I like to use. So if you see my Tuesday webinar, you're familiar with the slides. Um, so this is basically what your career path looks like when you move from junior developer to senior and beyond. Um, so you basically hone your tech skills um, and that takes you from junior to medior to senior. Um, once you're a senior developer, there's this unique pivot point where tech skills aren't enough anymore and your employers are going to look at your soft skills, uh, specifically your ability to lead a team. And that involves being able to delegate well and be able to communicate well. So these are special skills that you need to cultivate in yourself to become a good senior developer and uh, well, basically impress your employers so that you can pick and choose the projects that you like. 
But then if you want to take it further, if you already are a senior developer and you, go, you want to go beyond that, then you're going to have to find a niche. And so that's what this webinar is all about. We're going to look specifically at the machine learning niche. So uh, let's do a quick poll again in the chat. Um, where are you in, on, this, on this career path? So um, post in the chat um, where you are in the path. If you, are you a junior? Are you a medium? Are you a senior? So you're a senior if you have a team. So if you're a senior developer, you have at least one person that you can delegate to. Um, and feel free to say if you go beyond, eh? if you already are in a very lucrative niche beyond senior developer. So Kurok D is senior. Uh, Nil says he's meteor. Uh, Mark is meteor. Deepak is senior. Vidamantas is senior. Vidmantas, sorry. Amit Kumar is junior. Mihai is senior. Joaf is senior. Nelson is senior. Nice. So, so, so we have people from all over this uh, path. Tiago is senior. Nelson is a little, mostly Visual Basic Net and a little C sharp. Nice. Cool that you know both languages. Um, yeah, so, so we're, all, we're all along this career path. So that's pretty nice. So I noticed that none of you said that they were beyond senior and deeply embedded in a lucrative niche. So that's very good. So you're going to have, um, uh, you're going to learn a lot uh, from this webinar. Uh, because being senior is not enough. Um, being a senior developer is nice. But there's a lot of competition. Uh, globalization worldwide means that you compete with every other senior developer on the planet. Um, and running virtual teams is getting more and more popular. So imagine, for example, you're based in Mexico and you run a virtual team, then there's no reason why someone in Vietnam could not run the same team, but at a lower salary. Um, so it's, it's, uh, the, the world is getting very competitive uh, with globalization going on. And you really need to make sure that you have a unique skill set that is so rare in the world, basically, that, um, that it's very hard to replace you with someone else. Um, and the way you do that is by developing a niche for yourself, so a software developer niche. Um, so there's a little anecdote I can tell about that. Um, in the past, in the Netherlands, I was a uh, trainer. I, had my, I got my Microsoft Certified Trainer certification and I was doing classroom trainings. And um, one of the training institutes that I worked with, the CEO, asked me to do a BizTalk trainer. And um, I, I had no idea, I didn't know BizTalk. So I said, I can't do it, I'm sorry. And he said, well, I'm gonna give you the book and I'll give you a week to study and then just give it your best shot. Because he says, I have no one, so you might as well do it. You know, if you mess it up, it's still better than canceling the training. So, I mean, that was nice. He gave me a shot. So I studied the book for a, for a week. I did the training. And fortunately, the people in the training were all junior BizTalk developers. So I survived. Um, but from then on, it turned out there were only two BizTalk trainers in the all of the Netherlands. So any other training institute in the Netherlands, because word got around, any other institute, they had to call me if the other person wasn't available. So I had this steady stream of work for about five years. Um, like all the BizTalk train, trainings in, in Holland, I did them or the other guy did them. So that was fantastic. That was a niche, super lucrative niche. No one else was in there. And I, I could just pick and choose my projects. I could say no if uh, like a training institute was too far away and I have to travel for four hours by car. I would say, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it. I could name my price because there was no one else. So I could, I could ask for a very nice fee per day. So it was a very nice position to be in. And I want all of you to be in that same position. So um, what we're going to look at is a, um, a concept here called blue ocean and red ocean. Um, and so this works as follows. Um, if you look at the market for IT, um, there's multiple niches that you can be in. And um, you can define them by the level of competition. So we call something a red ocean if there is a huge amount of competition in the, in the market, um, if um, your skills, your particular niche is being done by thousands of other developers, millions of other developers as well, um, then it's, it's kind of like a sea with you as the shark. You're swimming around, you're looking for fish, but you're not the only shark in the ocean. There's a thousand or a million other sharks and you're all trying to eat the same school of fish. So it's a complete, chaotic, you know, uh, boiling ocean where everybody's fighting over fish. Uh, if that happens in an IT market, then the salaries go down. 
because there's so much competition, it drives the wages down. Um, so it's, it's a very difficult domain to be in because you compete with a lot of people. Um, it's hard to dictate your, your fee um, and you're easily replaceable. Now, a blue ocean is the opposite. A blue ocean is where there's almost no competition. So you're, you're the shark. There's maybe two or three other sharks. The whole ocean is almost empty and it's packed with fish. And you can basically just eat when you want. You can chill when you want. It's all good. Um, so if you look at the different specializations in the blue ocean or the red ocean, if you look at generic developer, so generic.net or C Sharp software developer, that's a difficult place to be in because uh, there's so many generic developers. I mean, you are a generic developer before you specialize. So everyone else can do that too. So it's, you're deeply in the red ocean if you're, um, if you're just a .NET or C Sharp full stack developer. Um, if you do backend, it's a little more specialized, but backend, it, it basically started decades ago. So um, it's a very old and mature domain um, with still a lot of competition. If you're a web developer, that gets a lot better. I mean, web is popular right now eh, with all the cool uh, front-end JavaScript stacks and Node.js, stuff like Angular, it's all cool. But competition is heating up. It's, because it's so popular, people are really flowing into web development. So it's right now, um, it's probably okay, but uh, you could probably, um, you, could, you have to be careful. It's, it might turn into a red ocean soon. Um, mobile developer, slightly better, developing mobile apps. But then if you look at the really new niches, like um, machine learning or AI, or big data, or even Internet of, Internet of Things, IoT. Um, it's all, um, those are deeply in the blue ocean. Um, so these are really, um, these are niches where there is demand from the industry, but there aren't many developers that can fulfill that demand. If, to give you an example, if you are a, um, oh, harsh is not audible, um, can you guys hear me okay? It should be okay, right? I mean, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's, uh, let's continue. So um, de developing a niche deeply in the blue ocean is a really good strategy that you can follow. Machine learning is really, really blue. Um, to give you an example, the salary, the average salary for a machine learning engineer is $120,000 per year in uh, $120,000 a year in the United States. And an average developer makes about $65,000 a year. So that's a huge difference. And the reason that that difference is there is because companies want to hire machine learning engineers and there's so few of them. So they have to offer high wages to pull those few people in. So if you are a, um, if you are a junior developer right now, and you focus on machine learning and you try to uh, ace machine learning in the next one or two years, then you have the opportunity to double your salary. And I'm taking these figures from Glassdoor. So these are from a Glassdoor survey. Um, they're based on US salaries, so they're, they're pretty high. But the, um, relatively, they're, they're the same in all countries. So in the US, it's like 65,000 and 120,000. And in your country, it would be lower numbers, but it would still be this factor of two. So this is, a, um, uh, this is an opportunity that you can grab. By specializing in machine learning now, you can, you can really move yourself into this safe niche. You'll be safe from outsourcing, uh, you'll fast track your career, and you might double your income. So it's pretty awesome. Um, so uh, let's do a quick poll again. Um, what are your niches? Um, if you don't have a niche yet, uh, just put, a, put in the chat the niche that you would like to specialize in. So would you like to become a mobile app developer? Would you like to become a web developer? Uh, are you fascinated by big data? I'll, I'll, I'll set the example here. So I would like to, I would love to become a machine learning expert. Nice vision. I guess that's computer vision, the Omedes. Awesome. Good choice. AI from uh, Kurok, yeah. Machine learning from Mark. Uh, Thiago says cloud, cloud is good. Um, K, I don't know, I can't pronounce that. Full stack, would like to move to IoT. IoT is good, yeah, good choice. Robotics from LTB, I like that. 
Um, Nelson, web developer, good, but um, don't study too long because uh, web is moving towards the red ocean. Um, Neil, Microsoft Dynamics CRM. Yeah, yeah, Microsoft Dynamics CRM works. That's like BizTalk. It's, um, it's, it's large, it's enterprise-y, you know, it's this huge, huge software, software package and it's not very sexy. So it doesn't have a lot of developers in there um, uh, catering to that particular market. So that will definitely work. Uh, BI and forecasting from Hector Celsa. Yeah, that's good. That's basically big data eh? and uh, uh, computers, no, not computer science. Um, what's it called? Data science. That's basically data science. That's good. Um, Biranchi says AI. Nice. So good. Eh? You're all aware of niches and a lot of you want to focus on machine learning and AI. Um, the other niches I saw are also nicely blue. So nice work. All right, so machine learning, um, very quick summary. What is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is, it's, it's basically creating smart software. So it's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's, um, um, you're creating software that doesn't have all the logic inside up front, but you create these learning systems and you train them on actual data. And then, they, uh, then they, the, the software basically learns to detect patterns in this training data. And then when you point the software at live data, it, it will actually apply its knowledge. Um, machine learning works with neural networks. Uh, nine times out of 10, uh, a machine learning algorithm is a neural network. And neural networks are modeled after what's in our head. So our brains, um, say our, our retina, our cerebral cortex is one gigantic neural network uh, with millions and millions and millions of neurons. And what we're doing is we're creating these tiny um, simulations of actual brain you know and teaching it different kinds of things so it's very cool um, because i mean we can do amazing stuff with our brains and all that potential is now also available for software um, and the more we learn about how our brain operates the more we can take the skills that we can do easily like uh, thinking talking high level planning strategy and we can bring that into software so very cool so it's deeply blue ocean um, the salary uh, can be twice as high as a uh, average junior developer. So you have the opportunity to double your income. Um, you're safe from outsourcing because there are so few machine learning developers right now. And it's exciting and meaningful work. A lot of machine learning projects are really, really cool. Um, for example, um, um, I've been working on an app that blind people can use to describe what's in front of them. So it's basically a camera that uh, takes a snapshot from a camera feed every 10 seconds. And then this machine learning algorithm will look at the picture and tell, tell you what's in it. So you're walking through the street and the, you have this voice in your ear that says, hey, so you're on a street with lots of people, you know? And then it says, you're standing in front of a shop and then you're inside a shop and then you're standing in front of a person, which would be the shop owner. And then, you know, you can order something. So um, for blind people, it would be really nice to have this constant narration of what's in front of them and what's going on around them. Uh, so you have the opportunity to build tools like that. That's, that's really, really cool. So moving forward, um, in this webinar, I would like to tackle um, four myths about machine learning. So these myths, um, I knew some of them upfront, but I also took some of them from the feedback I got from the webinar uh, we did on Tuesday, um, where we had, we had nice interaction in the chat and um, there was some stuff coming up and it's, it was really cool. It was basically misconceptions about machine learning. So I'm gonna look at four of them. Um, so the first one is you need a PhD in mathematics to be able to do machine learning. Not true. I'm going to teach you the mathematical foundation of machine learning in this webinar in 10 minutes. So after watching this webinar, you will get machine learning, you will get neural networks on, in a mathematical context. So nice, I can do that in 10 minutes. Second misconception, you need Python. So this, I mean, in the past, it was all Python. All the machine learning was all Python code, TensorFlow library, uh, that was it. It was really annoying. I mean, if you're a C Sharp developer, you have to learn Python, you have to learn TensorFlow, you have to get into this whole new domain to be able to get started. Now, fortunately, this is changing. Microsoft is working really hard to bring awesome machine learning tools within the .NET domain. And these tools, you can use them from C Sharp. 
So no more Python. The third misconception is that you need this huge gaming computer to do machine learning. Like um, you need, you know, like you need 20 GPUs. Uh, uh, you need this, this NVIDIA uh, 2070 graphics adapter, and then you need another six of them, you know, to be able to train a neural network in, uh, in, in less than 10 weeks. Now, not true. Um, there are shortcuts you can take to build machine learning applications to train neural networks, even if you have a slow computer. And case in point, my laptop is a MacBook Pro. So I'm developing my apps in Windows 10. I have to simulate that. I have a virtual machine running Windows 10 inside that VM. I'm doing my apps, I'm writing my apps and I'm training my uh, neural networks. I don't even have a GPU. I mean, you know, Apple, they put this really shitty GPUs in their, in their MacBook Pro line. So I can't even train neural networks on GPU because the thing in this computer is just crap. So, um, but I can, do, I can write my apps. So you don't need a fast computer. Whatever you have right now is fine. The fourth misconception, it's super complicated. Not true. I will show you um, a machine learning application. It's 260 lines of C-sharp code. I'll go through the app line by line to show you how it works and I'll run it so you can see what it does. It's a really cool app. We'll get to that at the end of the webinar. Um, 268 lines of C-sharp code. I mean, come on. And this thing does, does image recognition, it does face detection, face recognition. Um, it's, it's pretty advanced. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I wrote that app in a day. So piece of cake. So let's go through these myths one by one. But before we do that, uh, put in the chat which of these myths uh, you believe, you know, which, which of these myths kind of resonate with you. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll kick this off. Um, I believed in the past that myth one and myth four, one and four, were true. So I thought like the math is super complicated and it's, it's, um, and it's, it's really hard to do. So Joachim says one and four, Marx is one and four. Uh, someone said PhD in math, but it scrolled, so I, <laughs> I couldn't I miss it where that was. Charlie says two and four, Thiago says one. Binanchi says one and four, two and four. So a lot of you believe four, that's nice. Amit Kumar says one. Anything else? Uh, Kurok says one. One is still valid if you want to, if you want to dive deep in, correct. But um, to understand the, the basic foundation, you don't need the, the advanced math. Alwin says one and three. John says four. Deepak says one. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. A lot of you, I think we have them all. Eh? I've seen one, two, three, and four in the chat. So pretty cool. So none of these myths are true. Admittedly, the math can get complicated uh, with machine learning, but only when you start really diving into the, um, if, if you dive into the specifics. Um, the, the basics, the foundation is really, really simple. I was blown away when I learned it. It was like, is that everything? Oh my God, you know? So um, I'll teach you the foundation in this webinar because we only have an hour. Um, the, you can go deeper if you like, but with the foundation, you can already do a lot. But we'll get to that. Let's go through the, whoops, let's go through the myths one by one. So we'll start with the theory, the mathematical theoretical underpinning of neural networks. So I'm gonna teach you those right now. So look at this image. Um, how many of you have, have had this in college? You know, like you have these cluster of data points and then we're gonna draw a line through those points. And the idea is that the line is the optimal fit. So you want to have the closest fit, you know, that goes through this, this cloud of points. How many of you have seen this before uh, in university, college, whatever? Mark has seen it, Joaf has seen it, Hector, yep. Diomedes, yep. LTB, Thiago, Amit, Kurok. John, nice, Nelson, Mill. So this is pretty basic stuff, right? It's, um, it, it's, it's called uh, linear regression. And there's a bit of math involved to have, where you can calculate the optimal elevation and angle of the line so that it's, it's, it's the perfect fit through all the points. Um, but that's basically it. And you have this really simple uh, mathematical expression, um, which I've put in here. Yeah, it's like X times W plus B, which defines the, uh, the slope of the line. So, you know, X is like the, the horizontal axis, Y is the value. Um, and then the, 
W is just a constant. It defines the slope of the line. And B is another constant, and it defines the elevation of the line. So if you change B, the line goes up and down. So by manipulating W and B, we can create this, this perfect fit. Right? So it's linear algebra. So you guys are all with me so far? All right. So the next step is we can do this in more than one dimension. So we had X and Y in the previous slide. So there was only one X. So we call that one dimension. So if I add another X, so now I have X1, X2, and then Y. So X1 is like this, X2 is like that, and Y is like that. So it's like three dimensions. So now it's, it's not a line anymore. It's a, a plane, an inclined plane. Um, the data points are like this clouds, cloud of points that, that hang in space. And now we're trying to find this, this surface that we can tilt in two directions and we can move it up and down. And we try to find the optimal surface that intersects the points and it's as close as possible to every single point. So the formula is still the same, but now it's x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2 plus b. So now we have three constants. We have w1 and w2. Um, those constants control the angle of the plane like this and like that, you know, in two directions. And we have the b constant, which moves the plane up and down. So by manipulating these three constants, we can still, you know, get this, this plane to uh, intersect the points in such a way that it's as close as possible to all points. So again, this is still linear algebra. It's just one extra variable. We can expand this to multiple dimensions. Um, you can't visualize it anymore. Um, this is two dimensions plus the y value. So that's like uh, three dimensions. So it's a three dimensional uh, um, picture. Uh, when I add another x variable, then it becomes a four-dimensional graph and you can't visualize that anymore. Our brains can only process three dimensions. But in mathematics, it doesn't matter. In mathematics, you can have a thousand or a million dimensions. It's, it's just, it's the same formula and all the math keeps working. So that's basically it. So now all we can do is we can take this, this, um, um, this previous example with the x1, x2 and y, and we can draw it differently. So here, you're still looking at the same formula, so nothing has changed. But what we've done is we, we draw the formula as a bunch of circles and lines connecting those circles. So the, the, the x1 and x2, uh, which is uh, basically a data, input data, or measurements, uh, we draw them as circles. And the y value, so what, what the formula predicts as the y value, um, we draw that as another circle. So you have two blue circles and one orange circle. And that leaves the weights, and we draw the weights as arrows connecting those circles. Um, so the, what's not in this picture is the B value, you know, the offset that moves the plane up and down. Um, you, in this notation, you usually don't um, write down this constant, you don't write it down, but it's actually packed into that Y circle. So it's in this, this uh, orange circle right here. Um, so it's still the same formula. It's the, the, the multiplications are now uh, drawn with arrows. The fact that those two arrows come together in a single Y circle um, is an addition. And there's a constant packed into that Y circle as well. So um, we call those circles nodes and we call the arrows connections, nodes and connections. But keep in mind, uh, this is still the same formula. It's a super simple linear regression. We're using two variables and uh, three constants. So, okay, now prepare to have your mind blown. We can build a cat detector from this formula. And here's how it works. Uh, what we do is we take a picture of a cat. And then we take the pixel values. Uh, usually we would turn this picture into black and white because uh, it's easier to train a neural network on a black and white picture. So we take this black and white picture of a cat, we take the individual pixels, and we take the brightness value of these pixels. So that's a value between zero and 255. And we feed it into this formula. So we take two pixels and we feed it into x1 and x2. So it's a very simple formula, it's still linear regression. So you get this y value at the, at the output side. And this will be a number, probably it could be, it could be anything but usually the number is in the same range as the input. So it will also be zero to 255. So now we can say, okay, so um, let's say that values below 
128, that's exactly in the middle. Well, values below 128, then that means the image is not a cat. Values above 128 means we're looking at a cat. And then we feed this network a bunch of test data. So we're going to take this database with hundreds and hundreds of cat pictures. We're going to feed this database into this formula and we're going to play around with the values of w1, w2 and b, those three, three variables. We're going to tweak them until our formula can sort of predict if there's a cat in the picture or not. That's it. This is actually a neural network. It's really as simple as this. So obviously, um, it's not going to be very accurate. Um, the, um, our cat detector only looks at two pixels, and it only has three nodes and two interconnections. So, I mean, we only have three constants to basically train these hundreds and hundreds of cat images on. Um, it's not going to be enough. But the trick is to make this cat detector more accurate, you, you don't have to play around with the math. The only thing you need to do is add many more nodes. So this is what a typical neural network looks like. So keep in mind, this is still the same formula. We're still looking at a linear regression formula, but now it has a whole bunch of input values. So this would be x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on and so on. So we can look at many more pixels. We still have the output node at the end. So there's this one number that says it's a cat, you know, higher than 128. It's not a cat, less than 128. But now we also have these hidden layers. So hidden layers are just um, stacks of nodes between the input and the output. So these are extra variables in the formula um, that we can use to uh, make, the, the, make the, um, the neural network more accurate. Um, and this, this thing that I've drawn here, this is called a perceptron. And it's one of the first neural networks that was invented. It's, it's very old. It was invented, I'm not sure about the date, I think it was about 20 years ago. Um, and uh, it works quite well. In, um, um, I, did, um, I did a machine learning course a while ago, I, I, I gave a course, where we trained a perceptron to recognize handwriting, so recognize handwritten dig digits, so it's a form of OCR. Um, and a, a human would have a 99.9% .9 success rate on recognizing digits. And our perceptron, uh, we trained a perceptron up to 94%, 94%. So that's pretty high. So you won't reach human level uh, accuracy with this uh, structure, but um, you, get, you can get pretty darn close. And you can always improve the accuracy by adding more nodes. So you might be asking, if it's so simple, uh, how come it's only popular right now? And the answer for that is very, is very uncomplicated. Um, the, the only reason why machine learning has become so popular lately is because only now are we able to do this linear calculation with all those interconnections. The number of interconnections grows really, really fast if we add more and more nodes, and you need GPUs to uh, do those calculations in a short enough time. So this whole game development where gamers were demanding faster and faster GPUs uh, for better and better gaming resolution, um, at a certain point, someone discovered that you can use these GPUs to train neural networks and they were really good at it. Um, so this, this uh, development actually accelerated the adoption of neural networks. Um, and a second development was that now we have companies like Google who are sitting on terabytes of training data. Uh, and you need these massive training sets to accurately train a neural network. Seriously, training takes forever. But once you have this trained neural network, you can very quickly use it. So these developments mean that only now machine, that machine learning has become popular. But the underlying mathematics is super simple. It's just linear algebra. So after I've explained all of this, how many of you are now feeling confident that they understand the math behind machine learning? So put a, put a yes in the chat if you feel confident. So Akshay says, do we need a gaming laptop? You only need a gaming laptop if you want to train on your local computer. I'll get back to that later. Raf <laughs> says, me and Math don't get along. I'm sorry, Raf. So I, I guess I lost you halfway. Oh, well. So yeah, Max says yes. 
Uh, Hector says perceptrons for the win. Exactly. Natsuyapan says not fully. How do we get the slope values? So the, the slope, if you're asking how the training works, uh, so how the training algorithm determines what the slope value should be exactly, that's kind of complicated. Um, so I left that out of this explanation because then we would go deep into really complicated mathematics. But the point I'm trying to get across is that you don't need to know complex mathematics to be able to use a pre-trained neural network. And um, even when you only use pre-trained networks, you are still a machine learning developer. It's not, uh, um, there's no demand that you are supposed to be able to train your own models. So Joas says, if we understand, we are actually playing with it until we find a good result. Yes, that's what the training algorithm does. It keeps making tiny tweaks to the constants and then looks if the results get better or worse. And then when it makes a change and the results are worse, it discards that change and it tries a change in another direction. So it keeps attempting and attempting and attempting and it has, until it has a good, uh, a good solution. So Binanshi says, which mathematical concepts are required for neural networks? Well, linear algebra, like I just showed you. It's all just a gigantic amount of linear algebra. Exactly, linear algebra. So um, that was the foundation of machine learning, of neural networks in 10 minutes. So you see, it's, it's not that hard. It's, um, it, it gets a little bit more complicated if you look uh, in detail at a neural network. Um, these networks, perceptrons, are not super accurate. They, they kind of work, but uh, it's not great. Uh, and four years ago, someone invented this awesome new concept called convolution. Um, and if you add convolution to these neural networks, um, then they get super accurate and they even outperform humans. So that's pretty awesome. But I won't explain what convolution is. It's not that hard to grasp, but it's too long to fit in this webinar. So um, the, the basics, the linear algebra, that's it. Okay, so moving on. Um, myth number two, you need Python. Incorrect, myth busted, you don't need Python. Um, so here's an overview of what Microsoft has been doing in, um, uh, in, the, uh, era, in the domain of machine learning. I mean, Microsoft wasn't happy about Python and TensorFlow um, taking the lead in machine learning. Um, I mean, they, they want technology that's more closely aligned with their own um, infrastructure. Um, I mean, you can run Python on Azure, you can host it in the cloud, you can run Python notebooks on uh, Jupyter uh, servers, Azure has a Jupyter facility built in, so you, you can do all this Python stuff. But um, for C Sharp developers who are completely focused on C Sharp and .NET, um, it's kind of annoying that you suddenly need to grab this other language to do machine learning. So Microsoft has been working really hard to bring machine learning into the C Sharp, C Sharp and .NET domain. So one of the things they did is they built their own um, machine learning library, their own neural net library. It's called Cognitive Toolkit. So I've circled it um, at the bottom next to TensorFlow. Um, the nice thing about Cognitive Toolkit is it completely blows TensorFlow out of the water. It is so much faster than TensorFlow, you wouldn't believe. And you can speed up TensorFlow by compiling it. There's this language called Cython which takes Python and then compiles it to, um, to uh, I think to C, and then it compiles C to assembly, so you get the super fast assembly application. Even that is slower than the cognitive toolkit. So the, the, the machine learning community is still using TensorFlow. Um, I'm not happy with, with TensorFlow and Python. I've been running it on my MacBook in my virtual machine, and it's so unbelievably slow, you wouldn't believe it. And um, native .NET machine learning libraries are easily twice as fast as, uh, as TensorFlow. So it's quite shocking actually. So I'm really happy with the Cognitive Toolkit. Um, it's, it's this, so John put the link in the chat. Thank you, John. So you guys, you can click on the link and get some more information. Um, so this is really cool. It's a super fast uh, machine learning engine um, that's, that's um, it's going to be integrated in .NET Core 3. Um, I think it's, it's going to be put in Windows 10. Um, so you'll, you'll have it in Windows. It'll just be there and you can tap into it. So we also have Azure. Uh, Microsoft is making training tools available on Azure. 
So these are called the Azure machine learning services. So you can basically define your neural network in a visual designer in Azure, and then you can start a training session and Azure will train it for you. So Microsoft has these, these uh, cloud servers with grids and grids and grids of GPUs, and they will just train the neural network on their GPU grid, and then you can download the trained model and you can run it locally. So this is really cool because you get this, this massive um, cloud uh, GPU power at your disposal. And you can use it for training. Now, the bad news is you have to pay for it. Um, you have to pay for the CPU, for the GPU cycles, um, but it's not that expensive. Um, so you, for commercial projects, you can make the, the finances work. What you can also do is you can use pre-trained neural networks. So Azure has another service called the Cognitive Services. And these are pre-trained neural networks that are hosted in the cloud. And you can tap into an API. So you can just make an API call from your app into the cloud and give these neural networks an assignment. And then they will send the results back to you. And at the end of the webinar, I'll show you how to do that in c -sharp code. It's super simple. So these um, developments mean that you can now use Azure, Azure Cloud, to train your neural networks and even host them if you want. And then if you want to pull down these neural networks to your local machine and run them locally, Microsoft has done this really cool thing. They have standardized the format for a trained neural network. So if you train a neural network and you take this, this configuration, so this is millions and millions of constant values, you know, W1, W2, W3, and so on. So this basically this data file, you can download it in a format called ONNX. And um, I'll call it ONX because it's faster to pronounce. Um, so if you download it in ONX format, um, you can run this, this, this neural network locally on Windows. And you can tap into the uh, Windows machine learning runtime with C Sharp. So this is a really nice development. You can train in the cloud and run locally. And that will work on slow computers. What you can also do is you can convert machine learning, uh, trained machine learning models from one platform to another. So all this development in TensorFlow that's going on right now, um, a lot of academic research publishes pre-trained TensorFlow networks as part of their, their research for people to play with. And as a C-sharp developer, you can't really use it. I mean, you can use TensorFlow, but TensorFlow will only work with Python. You cannot tap into TensorFlow with C-sharp, so it won't work. Um, but now you can take this TensorFlow configuration file and you can convert it to ONX. And then you can take this ONX file and load it into Windows, and then you can run the neural network locally on your cognitive toolkit engine, which is built into Windows. So all these machine learning libraries are starting to uh, become compatible through this shared ONX framework. So Microsoft has been working with Facebook and Google in setting this standard. Um, so it's pretty awesome. Uh, Pre-trained neural, neural networks are becoming interchangeable. And with this development, it means that as a C-sharp developer, you can tap into all this pre-existing knowledge around machine learning. So Kevin says in the chat, uh, Kevin says uh, the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, so CMTK, seems to require Python. Right now, uh, CMTK, if you look at the documentation, they will only give you the Python code examples, how to tap into it. But if you go on to, um, what is it, code? Uh, damn, I forgot the name. This is a website with code examples. It's called code something. Um, if you know what I mean, put it in the chat. Um, if you Google, you'll find uh, C-sharp examples that tap into CNTK. Because the CNTK API is um, it's just a normal uh, library. Um, it's a DLL. So you can easily build a C-sharp library that, that directly calls into CNTK, and someone has done that. Microsoft is working hard to create C-sharp samples that um, uh, show you how to tap into CNTK. I've seen a couple of examples from Microsoft, so they're working hard to update their documentation. So right now, it might seem as if you need Python, but it's not true. It's just a Windows library, and uh, we have to wait for Microsoft to update their documentation files. But the info is out there. If you Google it, you will find it. It looks like Thiago found it. Cognitive Toolkit, CNTK, C Sharp examples. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like he found it. Awesome. So you see, the info is out there. Um, this is, you're at the vanguard of um, machine learning on Windows. 
But again, that's a nice thing. So, I mean, the documentation won't be completely finished yet. Uh, there might be bugs, there might be weird behavior in these, in these uh, platform tools. But remember, that's, that's what it means to be in a blue ocean. Uh, because this stuff is so new, um, um, there are not many developers that are specializing in machine learning on Windows. So if you can insert yourself into that niche and you can say, I am a Windows machine learning developer, then you've got a massive career advantage. And I, I urge you to take that advantage. So myth busted, Python is not needed. Okay, so moving on. Do you need a super fast computer to um, use machine learning, to become a machine learning developer? The answer is no. Um, it sure helps. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm using a MacBook Pro and I'm, I'm saving for a uh, Service Book 2, um, the 15 inch version with the uh, NVIDIA 1070, I think it is, uh, graphics adapter that will be perfect for uh, neural net training. Um, but for now I have this old MacBook Pro, but it's fine, it works. So you can get around slow computers by being smart about where you train and where you run your neural networks. So you can train in Azure, um, you train in the cloud, and then you pull your data down as an ONX file and run it locally. That works beautifully. You can also leave your trained neural network in the cloud on Azure and tap into it using an API. Um, Microsoft has a bunch of uh, technology demonstrators uh, hosted in the cloud that you can tap into. But you can also develop your own. Uh, so for example, if you want to do face recognition, uh, Microsoft has this, this little framework where you can upload pictures of people into the cloud. They will train a neural network in Azure, and then it will stay in Azure, and you can call into it using a, uh, using a uh, specific API. So you can do face recognition and offload all the uh, heavy lifting to Azure. So that's by using an API. So this, of course, works on any computer, uh, Raspberry Pi, um, old laptops, mobile phones, you name it, it will work. So what you can also do is grab a pre-trained model. So this is a machine learning model, a neural network that has been trained on a fast computer, and then just pull the data down as ONX, install it in Windows and run it locally. So this gives you access to pretty much all the academic papers that are being published right now. So if someone creates this neural network that can read English text and understand what the text says, and you know, create conclusions or summarize the text, then you can just take this neural network, you can install it in Windows and run it. And you know, so you, that brings you to the forefront of machine learning research. Um, finally, what you can do is you can, um, uh, you can train your neural network on your computer and then you can run it locally on your computer. Um, this requires a fast computer, uh, but it kind of, depends on what you're trying to do. When, when I uh, trained my perception to recognize handwriting, the training took about 20 minutes. So this is on a computer with a, this is a core i7, but it's virtualized. So it's a bit slower than bare metal and there's no GPU. So that takes about 20 minutes of training to get up to 94% accuracy. Um, so that's sort of acceptable. Uh, however, if you want to do really cool stuff like artistic style transfer, uh, you might've seen that in, um, in demos where they take, they take this painting and then they have this neural network that knows how to reproduce the painting in the style of Picasso. So it turns everything into Picasso. Um, so you feed it an image and then on the other side out comes a, as if Picasso had copied the painting in his specific style. Um, so you can do that in C Sharp. Um, there's actually code, C Sharp code floating around uh, online that shows how to do artistic style transfer um, on Windows in C Sharp but you really need a fast GPU uh, because if you do it on a CPU, it takes about a week to calculate one artist, to create one uh, neural network uh, tuned to one specific artist. And of course you wanna play around, you wanna experiment with parameters and do some quick adjustments. And with the GPU, the training time drops to 10 minutes. So it's, it's really dramatic. Um, so if you wanna train locally, uh, depending on the problem domain, a fast computer is useful. But if you don't have a fast computer, then just use one of the other scenarios. Um, there's nothing wrong with training in the cloud. Um, so Diomedes says the phase API from Azure, uh, it's too expensive because it gives you too much information. Well, it's not expensive. I use the phase API. In fact, I'm gonna show it to you in a few minutes. And it's free. 
um, if you take the first tier, it's called F1, then you get a limited amount of calls per, uh, per month. Um, and they throttle your rate, so you can't do like 20 calls per second. Um, but it's very easy to stay within that, uh, within that range. Um, and it's called F1 because it's free, free one. And I, I, use that, um, I use that API for my own demos. And it works fine. And you get all this extra information, but it doesn't matter. You discard the information you don't need and you only use what you actually need. The uh, processing time is still the same. Microsoft doesn't do these things in series. It has a bunch of neural networks that all receive the image in parallel, and then they all give it back the data in parallel. So if you get too much data, just ignore what you don't need. Um, so the Microsoft's Face API is pretty cool. Only not use Face API if network connectivity is a problem. So if you uh, don't have a network connection, or if you, um, you can't have the images go to Azure, because um, there is a security um, requirement, you know, that uh, the images have to be secure, something like that. But if that's not the case, I mean, feel free to use it. So the myth about, um, the myth about having to use a fast computer is busted. All right, so the final myth, this is really complicated, you know, and uh, there's no way I can write a machine learning application because it's like, pages and pages of code, and you need to be a senior, senior super developer to be able to pull that off. Not true, myth busted, and I will show you. I'm gonna show you some code, um, and um, I'll walk you through the code, so you can, um, you can see for yourself how easy it is. So let me quickly set up a few things. Um, so I'm quickly gonna look at the video on my phone so that I can see what it looks like. Right, so I'm gonna to move to my Windows 10 environment right here. So let me know if you can see my Visual Studio um, environment. Let's put in the chat, can you see code? So I actually can't see my chat window right now, so I have to scroll back. Awesome, yes, it's there. Okay, so let's go back. Okay, so this is an application that um, um, I'll, I'll um, feed it an image and it's going to search the image for faces. So it's gonna zoom in on all the faces in the image, all the faces it recognizes. And then it will feed every single face into a neural network that has been trained on facial recognition. So the network will try to recognize the face. Um, so this is a public neural network that is hosted in Azure by Microsoft and you can tap into it for free. And the beauty is this network, hold on, this network, has been trained to recognize 200,000 celebrities. In fact, it's over 200,000. So this is an insane amount of celebrities. Usually uh, face recognition only works on 10 or 100 people. Microsoft created this gigantic neural network and they just kept feeding it celebrity pictures one after another after another. So what it will do is it will identify the celebrity and then it will give me back the name. Um, so finally, what my app does is it will take this name and it will feed it into a um, Bing entity search. So this is a, a Wikipedia kind of search. Um, I'll give it the name of a celebrity and what I'll get back is a one paragraph summary of that celebrity plus a picture. So I'm basically going to ask Bing, who is this? Uh, give me a short summary who this person is and give me a public picture. So I'll run the app so you can see the app running before I go through the code. So here we go. So this is Windows 10 uh, running on a virtual machine in, uh, on, on a MacBook Pro. Yes, I am crazy. So here we go. So it's the, the uh, app is loading the famous uh, selfie that uh, Ellen DeGeneres made at the 2014 Oscars. So there's a bunch of celebrities in this picture and you can see that the Microsoft neural network picked up four. So these rectangles are where the neural network has identified faces. So that's just a neural net that has been trained to recognize faces, you know, like eyes, nose, and mouth, and it just locks onto every face that it detects. And then it takes these clippings of the faces and it feeds it into another neural network that tries to uh, recognize the celebrity. So you see, we've got four celebrities. So I'll grab Bradley Cooper. So when I click Bradley Cooper, it's doing the entity search now. And you can see that, uh, see it says Bradley Charles Cooper is an American actor. So it pulled this from Bing, from the Bing knowledge graph. 
uh, Bing actually knows who Bradley Cooper is. So I can do the same thing for Ellen. See, so it's, it's, uh, it recognized Ellen DeGeneres. So I can take a different image, like uh, for example, we can take a look at, um, we can take a look at, I don't know, let's take the Apollo 11 crew. So these are the three astronauts that piloted the Apollo 11 uh, and, and landed on the moon. So you can see um, Neil Armstrong is right here. See, that works. Michael Collins is here. And that didn't quite work out, see? So I'm doing an entity search of Michael Collins and Bing tells me he, he is an Irish revolutionary figure. So, okay, that didn't work. There's another Michael Collins out there. Let's test Buzz Aldrin. That worked, former astronaut. So that one actually did work. So let's do one more. Um, a bunch of American presidents. Here we go. George Bush right here, Barack Obama, uh, the other George Bush, Bill Clinton, and so on and so on. So this is really, it's pretty cool. Eh? It's this neural network. It's, uh, it can recognize over 200,000 people. If you're any kind of celebrity, it will recognize you. I actually, I built an app uh, for fun that just switches on the camera and it takes a picture of, of it took a picture of me and then it ran my face through the database to see if I'm a celebrity. I mean, you never know, eh? you might be a celebrity and you don't know it. Um, so this was a really funny app called Am I a Celebrity? And you could click a button and it would take a picture, send it to Microsoft, run it through this neural network, and then nine times out of 10, the neural network would say, nope, sorry. So you can do stuff like that with it. I'll show you the code. So this is 268 lines of C sharp code. And um, so all you need to do basically is you have to pull in a NuGet package called Project Oxford. So Project Oxford is the, um, the previous name of the Microsoft Cognitive Services. So they're, they're called Cognitive Services now, but in the past they were called Project Oxford. So it's a NuGet package, you just pull it in, and then um, you need to go to Azure and register for the free API access to get free access to the uh, Cognitive Services Vision API. So you can see right here, uh, these are my keys. Please don't copy these keys. Um, because then you'll overload my free account. Um, so uh, this is the uh, vision, cognitive vision API, and this is the Bing search API that I use to do the lookups and display that info on the right. Um, then moving down, all the magic happens here in this method called detect celebrities. So this code up here just cleans up the, uh, the window, uh, cleans up any old celebrities. So here's the magic, detect celebrities. Um, if I go in, into that method, you see all it does is it takes the image that I've loaded, that the app has loaded, and it, um, it stores the image in JPEG format into a memory stream. So pretty straightforward. And then it creates this thing called a vision service client. So you get this thing in the NuGet package. Um, so this is the client object that taps into the Azure API. So you initialize this client with your key and the API URL that you're gonna use. And then you simply call this method, analyze image in domain. Um, this method will um, upload the image to Azure. It will run the celebrities analysis and it will download a um, celebrity object, celebrity results object. See, it's right here, celebrities results. So it's in, it's in JSON format, so I have to use a JSON converter to convert it into an object. So if I go to the definition of the celebrity results, you can see it's just an array of celebrities, and each celebrity is just the name, the rectangle, you know, the area where the celebrity was detected, and a confidence value, that's just a number between zero and one. Uh, so the neural network will say, well, I'm 90% confident that Barack Obama is standing over there. Um, so we get these celebrity results and that's basically it. I mean, the next step, all I need to do next is to draw these rectangles on the screen. So this is just a bunch, bunch of WPF codes, WPF codes to draw these celebrity rectangles on the screen. You can see that I create this rectangle object. Um, I set the properties right here. Uh, you can see I, I put the celebrity name in the tag 
um, and then I, I put this rectangle on top of the image um, and then um, I create a label, the name of the celebrity. Um, and I put the label at the correct coordinates. I add it to the control, to the window. Um, and so I, ba I basically draw these, these rectangles. So if I click on one of those rectangles, I go into this function here. See, rectangle, mouse left button down. So I'm clicking on a rectangle. And what happens here is that basically um, I, I loop through all the rectangles. I look for the rectangle that corresponds with the, um, I look for the rectangle that has been clicked. I extract the name and then I throw that name. Let me find the right code. Uh, whoops, I got lost in my own code. Give me a sec. Yeah, here we go. So um, to find the uh, bio and the uh, picture of the celebrity, I use the entity search, the Bing entity search. And again, I get this beautiful object here that, that taps into the client's API. I initialize it with my key, my API key. Um, and then I just call this function search async. And you can see I provide the celebrity name as a query. And I get back this, this result, um, um, which is an array of possible things this could be. So if I feed Bradley Cooper to Bing, it's gonna give me a list of all the Bradley Cooper things, people and objects and movies and whatever it knows about. And one of them will be the dominant entry. Um, and that's the one I pick. So basically I'm asking Bing, okay, I have Bradley Cooper here. Um, who do you think that is? And Bing, Bing gives me this list of results and he says, well, I'm most confident that you're talking about the actor. And so I'm extracting that top result and putting it in the user interface. So, I mean, a lot of this code is just plumbing huh, to uh, get the results on the screen and interact with the mouse. Um, the code to interact with Azure is just like five lines of code. You can see if I scroll all the way down, it's um, 268 lines of C-sharp code. So it's fairly, fairly compact. So I'll just run it again. I can see that I forgot to disable annotation on this webinar. So uh, one of your comedians is drawing on the screen. Um, thank you. So here's the app again. So I'm using the free um, tier in Azure, the F1 tier. And you get loads and loads of calls per, uh, per month. It's more than enough to do demos like this. Um, let's take the cast of friends. Awesome. So it recognizes every single one. So Matt LeBlanc, I think he was Joey in Friends, right? There you go. That's the actor. Matthew Perry, right there. And what else do I have? I have the cast of the remake of Battlestar Galactica. Here we go. Edward James Olmos, fantastic role. Uh, we have uh, Katie Sarkov. Mary McDonnell. So you, you can see it's, the network is trained on celebrities. So um, it's really good at detecting actors. So obviously for this webinar, I'm using images with lots of actors in them um, because the net network performs best on that. If I show it my own photo, then you wouldn't see anything. It wouldn't be a rectangle because it's, it, uh, the network has no idea who I am. So I'm using a pre-trained neural network here, but so keep in mind, you can train these networks yourself. And you don't even have to do that on your laptop. You can use the online vision services, cognitive services. You can upload your pictures to that service, train the neural network on those photos, and then it will recognize the people in those photos. So what you could do is, if you work for a large company, you could take your company directory, take all the pictures, upload them, train a neural network on that directory, and then any group photos that get published on your uh, company website, the neural network would automatically lock onto the faces of all the employees and be able to tag them. Um, so you could very easily do that. And you can also do that in a live camera feed. Uh, so you could switch on a camera and then every five seconds, you could take a still image from the camera and then do face detection on that. So you can do cool stuff with this and you can do really dark stuff with this in Orwellian societies. So it's our responsibility to use this technology in a responsible manner. Um, because technology is just neutral. Eh? It depends on us if we use it in a positive or a negative way. 
All right, so that was the code demo. What do you guys think? So I think I busted the myth that machine learning is complicated. Joaf says that was amazing. Thank you, Joaf. I totally agree. So who agrees with Joaf? Thiago says it's great. So, okay, I see a bunch of questions up there. Uh, let me quickly scroll up the chat window. So John asks, what happens to the other celebrities? Why did it not recognize Brad and Julia Roberts? So um, the reason is Brad and Julia Roberts, Brad Pitt and Julia Roberts, they are in the database, but the faces weren't clear enough for the system to lock onto them. And this can happen if part of the face is obscured so like if it's, your face is only visible like this, then there's not enough detail for the neural network to lock onto. And it also happens if the face is too small. So if there are not enough pixels in the image to, to work with, then either face detection will fail or the celebrity detection will fail. So you need fairly large pictures to give the neural network enough pixels to work with. Uh, Geometer says the faces were blurred. Uh, no, they weren't. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I assure you they were completely in focus. Um, Kurok says, um, I have to leave, will you publish the code? Um, I'll get to that at the end of the web webinar. Watch the recording and you'll see what, uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, so uh, John says it's cool. Nil says there's a blue line. Yep, that's the, one of the jokers in this uh, webinar who is annotating the screen. Hamid says, will the video be available for viewing later? Yes, I am recording this. So I will email the link around. Um, Joaf says, can you please make a professional course that will make me a serious ML developer? Joaf, you're in luck. That's exactly what I'm doing. Um, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. Um, so here are our myths. So how many of you agree that I've busted all four myths? What do you think? I'll, I'll participate. I'll say I agree, obviously. So what do you think, John? Yeah, John agrees. Joe says kind of, okay, yeah, I get that. Neil says, yep. Joe says 75%, okay, okay. Beyonce says, yes. Ruben says, I agree, awesome. So, okay, so I, I hope I, I showed you that machine learning is not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, if you look at the academic research into machine learning, um, the math in these papers, it's mind boggling. Huh? It's like super complicated. Uh, academics have this jargon that they love to speak in that makes things really hard to understand. I mean, I, I studied physics. I have a master's in physics. So I've been in that environment myself. And um, I, I know that the academic world can be, um, it can be pretty hard to understand. And I've always hated that. Even when I was a student studying physics, I was like, for God's sake, just write it down in simple terms so it's easier to understand. So what I've shown you is the, the foundations of machine learning, the mathematical foundations, um, what's out there right now in Windows, and how you can easily do this on, a, uh, on an old computer. Um, and so, yeah, I hope this has boosted your confidence and that you feel ready to get started with machine learning because now is the time. Machine learning is super hot right now. All the top machine learning experts, so that's the people with PhDs, they've all, all been nabbed up by Google, by Facebook, and by Apple. So they all have, you know, they're off the market. Uh, but companies still want their machine learning experts. They're still looking for people who know machine learning. And they're not looking for academics. They're looking for people who can just make stuff work in practice. And those people are you and me. So if you get into machine learning right now, then in uh, four, maybe six months, you'll be so much up to speed that you can do a job interview and you would get through that job interview. You would get hired. Um, so um, <laughs> I see a bunch of questions. Let me, I'll get back to the questions at the end. Let me wrap, wrap up the webinar and then I'll answer your questions one by one. So um, you might be asking, where can I get this fantastic machine learning course that explains the basics to me in simple terms? and has me building machine learning C-sharp applications from day one. Well, I've got that. I'm working on a course. Um, I'm launching it in October, um, in, in the last week of October, but pre-registration is open. 
So if you're interested, so if you're interested in a course that doesn't go too deep into theory, I'll teach you just enough theory to, to uh, get started and to get by, but not so much that, you know, you zone out or um, it, it would be more about the math and less about the actual coding. So I'll give you just enough theory to get by, um, but you'll be building C Sharp apps from day one. So the whole, it will be five weeks and it will be one app after another, after another. We go through everything that Microsoft has to offer. We'll do CNTK, we'll do cognitive services, we'll do, use ONX files, we'll take a TensorFlow model and convert it to ONX and run it on Windows. Everything that you can do right now, we will do in that course. My goal is to get you guys through a machine learning job interview in five weeks. So that's gonna be our goal. Um, I want you to be able to upgrade your career at the end of this course. So if you're interested, uh, check it out. It's on my personal website. So it's mdfadager.com. Um, just go there. It, it's one big landing page that talks about the machine learning course. Scroll all the way down to the end, and there's this email form. If you leave your email address, um, then you, you just, uh, you're not committing yourself to anything. You're just signing up to an email list. I'll keep you in the loop on, as I'm fine-tuning the course curriculum. We'll, we'll probably do a bunch of surveys where you can, uh, you can help me um, tune the curriculum specifically to your wishes. And then in October, we'll launch, I'll open registration and you guys will be the first in line to join. Um, so if that sounds good, then pre-register and um, I'll keep you posted. Uh, so that wraps up this webinar. So if you, if you guys wanna contact me, here's a bunch of um, uh, venues you can use to contact me. So on Facebook, I'm MD Farager. My website is mdfarager.com. I'm running this awesome Facebook page called csharp.architects, which is all about csharp. I mean, it's, it's uh, mostly about machine learning right now, but I have been covering csharp performance tricks in the past, and stuff like design patterns. So I'm, I'm trying to create this global community around csharp. So if you like, uh, follow, like and follow the page. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, MD Farager. You can contact me on LinkedIn, MD Farager. And you can send me an email at, oh my God, mdfarager.com. So you can see, um, search for MD Farager and um, I'm everywhere using that exact same name. All right, so let's do a Q&A. Um, so let me check the time. It's 6.12. So I only went 12 minutes over an hour, which is like really short for me. Um, so let's do a quick um, Q&A. Um, so I'm scrolling up to the chat and I'm looking at old uh, questions, questions you posted a few minutes ago. Um, yeah, so Tiago asks, how can you market yourself as a machine learning developer? So what you can do is uh, get your knowledge up to, uh, up to par by attending a course, you know, or just pick a course <clears throat> like mine, um, and then do projects, just do some projects for fun. Um, create a cat detector and put it online, put it on GitHub, uh, post about it on social media, and then when you do a job interview and people ask you about your hands-on experience, you can say, well, this will be my first machine learning position, so I don't have any business experience, but check out my awesome portfolio on GitHub, like this beautiful cat detector. Um, like the app I just showed you, you can build something like that. And you can uh, make a little video and show it to people. You can post it on Facebook. And then when you look for a job, you show them your portfolio. So in my course, I really want to focus on that, on building apps. So to, to get you guys up to speed on building an app portfolio. Um, so the next question, what's a cell case for machine learning? Build a cat detector. Well, yeah, okay. That's, that's just fun. I can give you an example. Um, I, I did a, a computer vision course in February. Um, and it was tons of fun. And I taught, um, I taught my students how to build a traffic sign detector. So the idea was that you have this self-driving car, it's filming the road, so it's filming ahead, and you have this video feed, and you need to lock on to traffic signs. So we did a very simple uh, app that recognizes geometric shapes. So it would lock on to anything that was round. Um, so of course, the traffic sign in my demo video was a round sign, so it would instantly lock onto that thing. So uh, my students had a lot of fun building that, and then one of them, the guy went on and he, he built a money detector. So apparently he had this business case where he had a camera that was filming coins, um, like coins uh, going into a hopper and they had to be counted. So he created an app that used the same geometric shape detector, the circle detector, 
um, to recognize uh, coins. So you could just throw a bunch of change onto a table and point a camera at it, and the app would say, oh, that's $68.57. Pretty amazing. And he hacked that together in one day uh, using the traffic sign detector as an example. So there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities out there for machine learning. You have to think creatively. You have to come up with something that no one has ever thought of before. Um, so uh, Joao says, I'm feeling much more confident. Awesome, thank you. I'm very happy that I got you to that point. Uh, so he says, would it be much more difficult if we were working with our own network? Um, not really, no. Um, in my, um, I did a, a machine learning course, um, I think it was two months ago, um, with a small group. And it was really a small course, it was only a week. But we did training, we did model training, we built that handwriting recognition engine that did OCR on handwriting. Um, and that, that was about the same level of complexity as what you saw right now. So uh, no, it doesn't get more difficult than this. Um, so yeah, Diomedes says, uh, face API gets too expensive for a company that needs to recognize 400 faces a day. You are absolutely right. So for your use case, what you would do is you would take this face recognizing neural network and you would uh, run it and train it locally on your local system. You wouldn't use the cloud for that. Um, because I mean, Azure charges you for training. So obviously, yeah, you wouldn't use it. Running these things locally, it's basically the same. Uh, you need to write code to train this neural network, but the CNTK, the Cognitive Toolkit, has lots of specialized APIs that will speed up training for you. Um, and that's also something I, uh, I'll get into in my machine learning course in October. I'll show you how you can train locally. Uh, so I'll probably have to buy this service book too uh, before October so that I actually have a fast computer to, to demo that. So John says government spy agencies will have jobs. Yep, try to get hired by one, it's good pay. Uh, maybe, maybe they're listening in right now on this webinar. So if any spy agency is listening right now, um, hire, hire John. Um, Hector says it can be used for sentiment detection. Yep, I built an emotion detector uh, using uh, this, these techniques. Um, that was really funny. I even tested it on my wife. So I, I pointed the camera at my wife and I said, okay, now look sad, now look happy, now do this. And the computer was just tracking her. Um, you can even, um, if you Google it, somebody took the interview um, that, um, that um, the Facebook guy, my God, I actually forgot the name of the CEO of Facebook. Someone help me out, put it in the chat, please. I can't believe I'm forgetting these details. It's like I've been talking for one hour, so my brain is turned into pudding. Mark Zuckerberg, thank you guys. Someone took Mark Zuckerberg's testimony for the, in front of the Senate, the, the video feed, and ran it through an emotion detector. And he, he like, so you have the transcript of the interview and right next to it, you have what the, the emotions, the computer thinks that Zuckerberg is feeling. And it's hilarious because sometimes you see anger and contempt, you know, <laughs> revulsion. Um, so it's, it's really these micro expressions in his face that the emotion detector is picking up. Um, so <laughs> you can do really uh, weird stuff like that. Um, so what else, what else, what else? Uh, so Joach has a question. Um, do you think learning a, a Master of Science degree is better than online courses? Um, the disadvantage of doing a degree is that, um, I'm, I'm reading this book right now, uh, it's called The End of Jobs. Uh, you can Google it on Amazon. And the author makes a really good point that uh, certificates are on the way out. That a, or credentials. The credentials are less and less and less valuable. So you pay through your nose to, uh, to afford uh, credential to, enforce, uh, to buy a Master of Science degree and go through the study program. But in the end, there are so many people walking around with that exact same credential that, um, that it's not gonna give you much, uh, a much boost in the job market. So I would say it, it might work right now. Uh, I mean, I have an academic background, but that was in 1995. Um, but I mean, going forward in the future, I think actual experience building apps completely trumps 
a degree. I think that completely trumps the degree. If, if I were a startup founder, and I've, I actually was a startup founder twice, I started two companies in the Netherlands, so I've hired a lot of developers. And when I hire people, um, I always look at experience, a job experience. And even if you're just starting out, if you have hobby projects that look impressive, then you know, I'm impressed. If you waive a degree, I think, yeah, you know, that everybody has a degree nowadays, so you know, big deal. So it, it definitely will make a difference, but maybe the difference will be so small that it's not really useful. Um, and think about the money, yeah? I mean, you have to pay back, uh, uh, you have to pay back your loan uh, if you go for this. Okay, so um, I'll scroll all the way down. Um, if you guys have any more questions, you can post them now. So it's 6.20. We can do two or three more questions. So I can see you, you guys are brainstorming about a female emotion detector. I'm not touching that discussion. Uh, Diomedes says, perfect. Thank you. I'll keep in touch. Awesome. Thanks, man. <laughs> exactly, you have. Exactly true. Uh, <laughs> Hamid says, what about an app that can predict the stock market so we can all get rich? You wouldn't believe how many people are trying that right now. I mean, everybody's taking historical stock data and throwing it into a neural network to predict uh, future stock developments. You could probably do it for long-term investments. Like you look at the, uh, the metrics of stocks and you use those metrics to predict what the stock will do in a year. So where, where its value will be one year from now. Um, that probably would work, but you would have to wait um, at probably between two, or two to five years before you see a result. Um, so it's, it's not gonna help you in the short term. The stock market is completely chaotic. It's this chaotic pro progress uh, process, and there's no recognizable system in there at all. So there's nothing for the neural networks to latch onto. Uh, Akshay says, this was great. Thank you, man. Name an author of the book you just mentioned. Um, yeah, geez. Um, so the book is called The End of Jobs. The End of Jobs. And the author is called, can do a quick search if you want. I can't see what I'm typing. I hope I did that right. There we go. So it's probably the top one. Yeah, here we go. Taylor Persons. This is the guy, Taylor Person. So I'm, I'm reading that book right now. Um, and so the author makes a case that entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism is the future. And that like a steady nine to five job for a large company is on the way out. That the uh, amount of available jobs uh, is gonna shrink more and more. And the only way to survive in the future in a world of globalization and automation is going to be entrepreneurship. And I think he has a point. So it's, it's, it's worth taking that, his viewpoint into consideration. Um, what will the course fee approximate range be? Um, so it's gonna be a couple of hundred dollars. So it's not gonna be super cheap. I know that Udemy is full of $10 courses, but this is advanced stuff that will double your income. So um, I think it's worth um, uh, a bit more money than that. So I'm thinking of a range between 400 and 500 dollars. So keep that in mind. Uh, but remember, the objective of this course is to get you to a point where you can apply for a machine a learning developer job. And if you pull that off, then you will definitely increase your income. Uh, you might double your income, so it will earn itself back in no time. <laughs> Universal income will need to happen soon. I totally agree. 